Hey everybody, Bobby Medina here, back with my good pal Paul Barron, and our guest today currently serves as the Director of Jazz Studies and Professor of Music at the University of Cincinnati's College Conservatory of Music, or CCM, uh, where he directs a CCM Jazz Orchestra and teaches applied trumpet. He's also a founding member of the critically acclaimed Tromba Mundi Contemporary Trumpet Ensemble, and he's toured as a member of the Grammy Award-winning funk legend Bootsy Collins Funk Unity Band as lead trumpet. He's also served as cornet and trumpet soloist with the Air Force Band of Flight in Dayton, Ohio. And he has played with so many, I, I talk all day long about it, but I'll throw out a few uh, different uh, ensembles he's played with. His recording credits uh, include recordings as lead trumpeter or guest artist uh, with the such grand names as the Cincinnati Pops featuring the Manhattan Transfer, uh, the Glenn Miller Orchestra, uh, jazz soloist with the University of North Texas One O'Clock uh, Lab Band, uh, which uh, whom he's recorded four CDs as a jazz soloist and and in the trumpet section, and he's also uh, performed as principal and lead trumpet with the St. Louis Symphony, Indiana Symphony, Cincinnati Symphony, National Symphony. It goes on and on. Yeah. Welcome, Scott Bell. <laughs> nice to be here. Thanks, Bobby and Paul. It's, it's it's a pleasure to join you. I've been I've been looking forward to doing this. For for a while and we've been looking forward to having you on for a while so yeah. i'm glad we yeah. uh, all the the uh, planets aligned so yeah hey i've got a i i guess it's maybe a chicken and egg kind of question for you so mm -hmm. i'm i'm wondering did you have a natural physical kind of uh propensity to be able to play uh all of these really technically hard uh, flexibility exercises already and then you wrote the book or did you uh, really want to work on that yourself and that's how things evolved well i i don't know that i had a natural propensity for for you know flexibility itself but i did all the stuff that i was supposed to do that my teachers gave me over the years which was the earl irons book and some of the walter smith things and then eventually into well and of course arben page 42 like 17 18 19 and I, I did do the homework on that. I knew what the assignment was when I was coming up. And, and eventually, I, I think of flexibility sort of like a, uh, um, the kind of technique that is, it can be very difficult until you figure it out, and then it becomes a lot easier. So certain techniques are that way. Some are just always difficult, I guess, for some people. Um, but it wasn't like I was like a naturally super flexible person. I just kind of did it, you know. Well, and I have to say here for everybody, because I missed it on the introduction, but um, Dr. Scott Belk is uh, the, the author of this wonderful book called Progressive Lip Flexibilities for Brass. And now I had the first book as well, and now I've had this one, and you've taken this to a whole other level, uh, both technically and musically, which I think is just really, really awesome. And uh, I've been working out of it here. Uh, lately, and I really enjoy it. And I have to say, for, from my own standpoint, and, and you may agree or disagree with this, both of you guys, um, but one of the things that really helps me, I think anything can be overdone, but one of the things that I really love about this uh, book and this approach here is the combination of alternate fingerings that you're using in this and just different sort of um, ways, you know, different types of exercises that are both of a musical nature and as well as a technical nature. It, it does to me what Paul and I have talked about uh, a lot, which is, uh, what do we call it, Paul? It's like, I call it variance and Paul calls it the kind of muscle confusion. And mm -hmm. by doing that, it sometimes really helps change things up, at least for me. If I do too much right. of the same thing, I feel like I get in a rut. So yeah, these yeah. new types of exercises, new uh, angular types of playing and all that really I don't know, they just really make my chops feel good. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, I, and and I'm I'm pleased that you you've experienced that. I kind of get that myself, and I I get a lot of feedback from players and teachers that that uh, I guess that's one of the uh, sort of markers for if we're if we're m meeting our goal 
is that, uh, and I work with my students on some of this as well, is that if you do certain things for a while in, as part of your maintenance routine or your warm up or your, your technical routine, um, when you're done working on them, you're actually in a better place chop wise and musically. So I think a lot of times we get used to practicing things and we just get more tired as, as we practice them. And, and I, I like to think of some of these flexibilities and intervallic kind of uh, studies that if, if you're practicing them in a way that you're really, I think of it as compressing the register of the horn. So things get closer and closer together and easier to play so that the idea isn't to start at the beginning and go to the end, but is to take, the the phrases the intervals the the shapes and make them more smooth and refined and as you do that they get easier and as they get easier uh, i think uh everything gets easier that's the that's what we're trying for so yeah we want to be able to move like the the actual uh i think a lot about on different levels uh the writing of the, the second book was a, a sabbatical project so it took a, 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 a semester from my teaching position and I, I sat around compositionally and started thinking about how to apply and and build on the ideas from the first um, book with but still like I, I they have to check certain boxes is it cool to play is it have a groove to it D is it something you'd want to play anyway that sounds like a piece of music so so they're not exercises in the in the traditional sense that they're like many, many, almost like mini etudes, and some of them can just be a couple of bars. And when you look at it from that standpoint, then the sort of the mission is different than just, you know, I have to, you know, lift a weight or to do a, uh, an exercise, but it's actually about navigating musical lines and, uh, and, it's fun. and, and connecting everything. Yeah, yeah, that's just the idea, you know, and it, it have, you know, and, and you don't have to do a whole lot of it. I don't think it's like necessary to sit down and do an hour or 30 minutes of this. I, I don't do a lot of it. I, I do enough to kind of get things lined up. And, and, and there's a, a concept that there's a, a, a podcaster, Tim Ferriss, I'm sure somebody's brought that, that name up at some point, but talks about the minimal effective dose of something. How little of this can I do and still get the get the be benefit? And that's what I'm looking for when I in my own practice and for my students. So we're not overwhelming my practice with a bunch of anything, whether that's uh, uh, you know flexibility or any other kind of technical work. Well, I've yeah. got uh, the copy of it sitting at the theater, and as a matter yeah. of fact, it travels in the road box. I don't tell the librarian of the tour. Yeah, but, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it lives in there all the time. And so when I get to the theater early, I'm usually the first one in the pit, just because I enjoy like being there in the quiet and, mm -hmm. and I I can destroy the, the quiet all by myself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, doing like 15 minutes is about the, the, the sweet spot mm -hmm. for me. And what I found is that it's a really good way to make sure that I'm, I'm balanced, you know, and mm -hmm. if I'm not, I'm not able to get through it with that same kind of ease and right. uh, flow and, and to compress the registers yeah. that we're talking, but okay. boy, if I stick with it for about, you know, the 10 minute mark, ah, it's coming back to right. so yeah. it's, it's really cool. In yeah. That. Yeah. And, and it's, it's uh, the, the idea that there's certain kind of practice that you can do that it's it it refreshes what you're you know it, it gets things going better you know you're done with it and you're the next thing you're ready for the next thing and uh i find that I, if i can play like flexibility softly i find that I really that tells me i'm i'm doing it that's my one of my markers for whether i'm doing it right can i can i get around the horn can i do this without a lot of volume and you got to be pretty elastic I, I, one of the the terms i think from the original Clark book that I really like is is he talks about the elasticity of the of the chops and or the lips and and which means that the the state of of your chops have it I mean it, it's elastic it, it, when we go up in the upper register we're playing he, ha, heavier or harder things maybe things get more compressed or tighter or however you want to conceive of it but then also that we were able to let that that extra tension or extra muscularity go if we go into a softer more uh you know supple type of movement or range or register or dynamic and to feel that you have uh sort of an a, a, an ability to move around with ease and and a nice sound you know and and then to back up and play okay now i can go back up in the upper register where i'm not just i used to when i developed really worked on developing my upper register as a you know i wanted to be a lead player 
everybody wants to be a lead player in a way, but I wanted to really work on it. And, and uh, I developed this area in a way that I really thought sort of had to be, the corners had to be this way and everything had to be pretty, had to maintain a certain level of, of, of uh, I thought of it as positive tension, but it was, it was more like lockdown. And what I found was is when I locked everything down, I went in the lower register, everything didn't really want to respond or be resonance and I resonant. And I thought, well, you know, that's because I'm playing a lot of lead or that's because, well, it really wasn't because I was playing a lot of lead. It was because I was really not learning how to let my embouchure and my lips breathe and to, and to find, a, I don't want to say relax, but to find a way to be elastic enough to vibrate and, and come into these different states. I think of them as like almost like three dimensional uh, tension, uh, ways of, uh, you know, your chops can do all different kinds of shapes and, and movement, and you can find that type of, mu of, of positive movement. And when I think we sometimes get to the point where we're like, we think movement, all movement is bad. We, the, that pendulum swing, we were sort of talking about it where it's like, okay, well, I had to be, you know, and I found that was really helpful from my earlier career when I didn't have high chops or didn't have good endurance that I did have to develop this muscularity. And I, of course, overdid that and then had to, had to come back the other way. Well, I think you hit on something a while ago. And as we, as we get older, hopefully we get a little wiser and we learn to play uh, more efficiently. But one of the things that trumpet players often do is they keep beating this, you know, beating themselves mm -hmm. up. And I'm gonna, I need mm -hmm. to get stronger. I need to do it harder and more yeah. until they can't play anymore. But the, but the real idea is, and Paul and I teach this, um, is, you know, you wanna make the trumpet as easy as you can, not as hard as you can, you know, it's kind of, a, a, inversion thinking from how a lot of people uh from what a lot of people believe you know but really that's that's key to being able to play all over the horn and to have good endurance and to be consistent also from day to day yeah yeah well i mean as part of my routine i will always uh i'll play some upper register music i do i'm doing things a little different i mean maybe we'll talk about that if we have a minute but um, I always make sure to get into the upper register, but I don't, if I'm playing lead, if I have a gig that I'm playing lead on uh, or a show or, uh, and I don't, I don't do shows like Broadway shows anymore. That's just something that um, I'm, I've just sort of gotten away from over the years. And, uh, but uh, I'm playing a lot more, more big band stuff really, you know, and, and uh, I will, if I'm playing that day or that night, I'm not going to do any exercises to build my upper register because I'm going to be playing in that register quite a bit, you know, for a couple of hours likely. And I don't, I don't find that that that's really a great use of my time at this point. Um, but if I'm, you know, people look at a routine and they say, well, this is my routine. I'm going to do, it's going to be exactly the same every day, which it, I think it should be for a while. But um, it also should have some, I, I would imagine Paul that you've got, uh, I, I call it uh, you know, Carrie Deadman. You know, I, I, I think of Carrie when when I uh, Carrie's a wonderful show play, show player up and uh, lead player up in Chicago. And my wife and I went up to see him play Tootsie. That was the last night. And Tim was that's where I met Tim, Tim Burke. We were just talking about Tim, who you're on the road with. And um, mm -hmm. and uh, Carrie said that that when he sits up, sits down to, to warm up for the, a show day, uh, especially if he's had shows the day before that um he counts how many times it takes to get a note out so like pff, no pff, no pff, no pff. And, and he said on that day which was the last day of the pre uh, they, they had done the run it was the last day it was a sunday matinee and he said it took seven or eight tries to get a note out and I was like, oh, this sounds horrible. <laughs> this, this is my idea of a bad time. And, and, uh, but he is such a pro that he knew that, well, okay, it's a seven foot day. Uh, here, I'm going to start from this point. And, and basically into where he's taking the chops and, and reforming them, uh, repairing them and making them come back to functioning after playing Damage a bunch of high, high. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that's like one mode of playing. And it's super necessary. And he's a, he's in he's got to be around uh, probably sixty. So you know, and that that type of of warming up and practicing perhaps is is more for him more important now than it was ten years ago. 
and and so the, the, it's evolved though his 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 way of practicing is always going to evolve and i think that's part of the long game that we're playing with our practice is to understand that yeah i did the same routine for like 20 years and i wonder why i wasn't getting any better <laughs> well oh sorry Let, i was just going to shift gears here real quick because yeah. it brings me yeah. to a point that a lot of people ask now that you you talk about show players because i know paul yeah. and i have talked about this he's he's like what is it eight nine shows a week you're doing paul something like yeah. that and that's a lot of playing by any but by any measure and every once in a while i get stuck in a show and i'm playing I, I did a while back i did i did this crazy elvis festival and we were playing like nine hours a day for like five days so it was a lot a lot of playing with rehearsals yeah. with all the different people and all that did you and tell so, them don't be and, cruel <laughs> <laughs> that's the point <laughs> um, but my, my question to you is, and I think this is something that everybody would like to know, because we're all different. We all have our own ways of coming out of, coming out of uh, tired chops or stiff chops or beat up chops or whatever. So what do you, when you have one of those days when you've been playing hard and you have to go produce the next day, what is it that you do to help bring yourself out of your funk, so to speak? Well, I do a couple of things. One is I, I try to, th if you think of that question from, you know, I, I think that the idea of what I'm pr doing to practice is to avoid being in that position as much as possible. Absolutely. So, so my, my, my practice and my, this is the other mode or another mode of, of, of kind of playing. So if I know I've got something that's coming up, that's in that in that mo in that sort of uh, ballpark, high I, I think of the high intensity playing, and the high intensity playing is high volume for a long period of time, possibly in the upper register, mid to upper register. Um, that takes a different kind of practice beforehand to to train to be in shape to not damage yourself. So you see, I look at the calendar and I say, oh, I've got this thing coming up, and and maybe and I by at this point I'm 56, I don't take that much of that stuff. I don't because of for, for various reasons I, I I have I'm doing more jazz playing and more improvising and more uh, things that I'm sort of picking and choosing them at that point in my life where um, I'm looking at you know do I want it you know and sometimes I'll get a call to be it'll be a, like that you know we got this festival it's a great band it's going to be uh, you know this particular show and I'm less likely to actually even take work like that now than I was you know maybe five or ten years ago but the 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 important thing is is to look at like like I think we're always making a um, a choice about in from one moment to the next about what's important and how much energy and intensity we're going to play with and how much we're going to have to pay the piper later. So one of the things that like Wayne Bergeron talked about in one of the master classes I remember him talking about it is when he got to if I hopefully I'm remembering this correctly but when he got off the road and went back to uh, be in the um, in, in do, do session work. He said that I think it was his sitting next to maybe George Graham or some well-known um, lead player, and Wayne was playing first. And he asked for some feedback at the end. And and I think he, the the person he was sitting next to said, "You sound great, but you're at a hundred percent. You're playing at a hundred percent intensity and volume." And and he said, uh, "I don't go past eighty or eighty-five. All right. So so I think when we have tired or sore chops or swollen chops, um, you have to be honest to know, well, is it really because of the gig that I played or is it because of the way that I played the gig? And, and that is a, those are two different questions. And so, um, you know, if, you know, if you're playing literally nine hours, it's probably the gig. <laughs> 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 was I but was backing off all right, I could. Right. I had my monitor yeah. cranked. <laughs> yeah, and and so that's my idea of a bad time. You know what I mean? It's like trying to figure out how to how to navigate something like that. From a repair standpoint, at this point in my life, the thing, the first thing that I do is I, uh, you know, I know a lot of people, and I used to do a warm down. I know a lot of great players that do a warm down. Um, when I'm done with a gig, I stop playing. Because I think the very first thing that you need when you're when you're you know when you've gone through a, an intense session is rest. So I want to rest as quickly as possible. So I've not really found a great benefit myself personally of doing of, of I'm done with the gig. Just put the horn away and start resting. Um, I try to kind of curate my day or my week around things like that. So 
I, I'm a super early morning practicer. I'm usually up, you know, around five and I practice at five thirty, six o'clock, somewhere in there and you get a couple hours in before anything happens. But if I play some like a heavy, if I play a big band thing, uh, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not, maybe I won't, won't touch the horn until noon. I'll make myself just do that and rest. Um, and I think it's in my, one of my books in the, in the preface that I say, you can't practice your way out of sore chops. And I really believe that. So, you know, I used to try to do it and I'm like, wow, just, just really isn't working very well. I just should do more of it now. Just need to let my, the natural healing process happen. And, uh, you know, don't try, I mean, if you're, if you're bruised or in, you know, I like to run, but if my legs hurt, I might not run that day and that's okay. Uh, but the idea is again, to not get to that point. And that's sort of a different question. I've, I've often told trumpet students, you know, pretty much the same thing. You need to take some time off. You know, I, I'm not yeah. like you, I'm not a huge warm down guy. If I feel really beat up, I might do some pedal tones for a little bit. Mm -hmm. But for me, one of the things that brings me out of it quickly is ice and maybe a little bit of Advil if I need to t play the next day. Yeah, one yeah. of the things, if, you, if you've hurt your, you hurt your shoulder, you don't go around beating your shoulder, you sure. know, to make, but yet trumpet players, well, I'm yep. beat up and tattered, yeah. but I'm going to keep forcing myself. And it's, it's akin to that, you know, and I, I don't understand it. I guess, I guess yeah. I, I kind of went through that when I was very young, but. Um, yeah, there's a great article. It's a, it's an interview with Frank Simon from when he got on the uh, Sousa band. It's called the greatest advice I ever got. And, and I have a copy of it. And I showed it to my students. Actually, I was just looking at it this week with a student. And when Frank Simon got on the uh, Sousa band with uh, Clark, he beat his chops up. He said they were literally bruised. He said they were black and blue. And he went and he, he tells the story. That's the so if you look up Frank Simon, great, best advice or greatest advice, I found it on the Internet somewhere. So it was um, maybe 20 years ago or way well, yeah, out. There was Internet 20 years ago. Anyway, um, but he said the first thing that Clark did is said, look, um, sit next to me and don't play for the next couple of days. Pretend to play and don't look up at Susan. <laughs> Just don't look at him and don't worry about it. I'll take care of it, you know? And, and then what he did was he went in and he said, it took like a couple of days. He was, he went to see Clark and tell him he was going to quit. That was how bad it was. He said, I beat my chops up so bad that I couldn't play it. It physically hurt. And then he, um, he, he went um, after he got through that point, he started to practice with Clark and Clark was doing all the stuff that he does, you know, that he was teaching and putting in his method books. So I think one of the things that's missing from a lot of, of like routines and, and foundational chop approaches is just a really, really, and I think there's more of it that needs to happen than most people give it credit, a foundational uh, layer of soft playing technical work that can be sustained. I call it chop neutral. It's the type of, it's the type of practice and, and, pr and playing that you do that, and it's related to what we were just talking about with the flexibilities, is that you play, it's like the chop meter is full and I play Clark studies and it starts to come down as I'm you know, doing repetitions or everything like that. I'm playing at such a volume and such an intensity with an, enough rest that when I rest, I come back to full. So, um, you know, I was just talking to somebody about this rest as much as you play idea, which sounds good on paper, but it doesn't really work because it doesn't account for uh, the intensity of what you're doing. So if I'm playing, like I do slots, which are sort of upper register things, and I, may I time everything and I time, my, I time my rests, and I make sure that no matter what happens, I don't cheat on the, on the rests. And so what happens is like I might do... I might play five minutes at a very soft, low, uh, in fact, I do that every day, and I'll take two minutes off. Um, but because I'm playing five minutes softly, I don't need five minutes of rest, and it would be stupid to take it. I'd be wasting time. So we're trying to, to get an idea that what's happening while you're playing is, you know, you're sustainable, but most people, what they do is they, they have the chop meter, they start warming up or practicing and it just basically, they're just emptying the tank of chops. And there's a certain point over here where it's an empty and basically bang, it's you're out. There's no amount of anything you can do to, to it, you've got lactic acid that's built up in the muscles that, you know, you just, the only thing to do for that is time. And when you're, when you practice that way, that's, 
that's really, you know, it, it's, it's what a lot of people do. You have to do what Vince DiMartino said is stop doing that. <laughs> I used to do that or whatever. And then I just stopped doing that, you know, and, yeah. and, you know, it's, it, it's, it's like the simplest advice, but most people don't have the self-discipline or self-awareness to, to, you know, really know where they are, what they need to, to know their body. Someone, you know, like, like you guys understand that, that what we're doing is we're, we're studying ourselves, our playing so that we're really in tune with what we need to do and what we need to not do and how much is, is enough. But one of the things I like to, to say to my students is, is that when I do, like I say, I might do Maggio, which is fairly loudly, just, just the uh, uh, basic warm up for Maggio. And it's like three minutes. I do that fairly loudly, so I'm not playing all noodly. And I take a two or three minute rest. And it doesn't matter if, if my chops feel amazing, I'm going to make sure to take that rest. So I think what people will do a lot of times is that the better their chops feel, the, the less rest they're going to give themselves on the front end. So for me, I'm like, no, well, that's two minutes. I'm taking that regardless. You know, to have that organization and to think about zooming out on what you're really trying to do. And I think that's where we have a lot of really smart people that don't do smart things in the way that they practice because they're, they tend to think on only one level. I think it's, it's really like, okay, I'm very linearly or very sort of up close. And I'm, I'm trying to zoom back and say, okay, what's my Friday look like? It's, well, it's Monday, you know, what's my Friday look like? I need to be, I need, I need to worry about Friday, you know, and you're, you're, you know, you're just, you're, you're looking at it and using your intellectual capacity on more than one level. I think it's important. I've had people describe this to me. I had a teacher that once described it to me as you can have a positive or a negative lip reaction with your playing, mm -hmm. you know, and you always want to try to have a positive and keep that positive, you know, thing, that feeling going. And then I've had another friend of mine, a trombone player of all people, um, that told me, uh, one of his teachers told him, remember this all the time. However good or bad you feel at the end of your gig or your present uh, or your practice session is how good or bad you're going to feel the next time you pick up the horn. And for me, I've found that to be pretty true. True. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's just knowing you're playing, but understanding that the goal is, is of all the stuff is, is are you practicing in a way that supports playing the music that you're going to perform? You know, and, and so like, if you're, if your music is requiring a certain skill set and your plaque, I, I would imagine, Paul, that you, you go through this, is that you're, there's a certain skill set that you have to, you know, kind of put out there musically every night. And the gig itself actually probably takes care of a lot of that and that you're able to, in your practice, to actually cover other things that are not required by the, the music that you're playing. So you've got, you've got sort of those two ends of, of what, what you're going to practice. It's like, well, I don't have to use, I don't have to do any double tonguing at this point in my life, like very little. So I, it might be good for me to actually practice some because the music that I'm doing doesn't does not require it um but you know so there's 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 all these different ways that you come at it and you can look at it globally and and from different you know but it all comes down to what am i going to what do i want to be able to play musically and uh is this get me you know i can't imagine you know uh you know maynard ferguson sitting around and playing a three-hour routine uh nobody ever talked about him uh practicing anything in fact i don't know anybody in my life that's ever heard him practice that ever you like you know all of us have worked with doc and know doc and have and the first thing everybody talks about is how he practices you can't you can't that means you can't even tease the two out it's doc and practicing but then all the people that we've known that played on maynard span i never heard anybody talk about him practicing anything maybe maybe you know uh, uh, getting a horn, you know, somebody Holton had to bring a horn in emergency horn, you know, and, and so he played a few notes on it before the show, you know, but, but so there is, but he didn't need to practice because, you know, of the way that, you know, he just learned how to play. And that's a, another thing too, that's worth thinking about. Um, there's a way to play. And if you learn how to do it, you, uh, it makes a lot of the practicing obsolete. Well, and that brings me to a great point because I just personally uh, went out of town, had a little celebration for a few days. Yeah, yeah, wine and, country. I, I saw, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so, you know, uh, after all the debauchery that took place, uh, I mean, I, I, 
I didn't really play. I did take my horn, but I didn't play. I didn't play for three days. And at this point, I shouldn't even have taken it. I thought about just going to forget it. Just, mm -hmm. I'm just going to leave it at home. Next time for three days, I am going to leave it at home. Because <laughs> at this point in my life, I mean, I feel like, yeah, I feel a difference when I come back and I haven't played for three days, but it's not mm -hmm. like the horn has totally escaped me, you know? Sure. Yeah. And, I've, uh, and I think that's kind of, I'm sure there was a point in Maynard's early youth and, you know, where he was working hard and practicing and stuff. Yeah. And then you were talking about, you know, not warming down. And I've, I, I don't know this to be fact, but I've heard or read somewhere that Doc Severinsen, after doing a concert, I mean, he would often go practice, I've heard. Sure. After, yeah. after the gig. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. like, I don't know about that. But I guess that's why he's Doc, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, and 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 you know, you can like from and imagine it if you think of your a continuum of how to play because there, there's lots of different ways to play, and I mean, you've got I, I think of like you know on one end you, we we use the word efficiency. I don't even like that word because it's industrial. And it's just, you know, the, we have a, a high degree of virtu virtuosity of someone that can play up to the highest notes and, and do things very technically. And then you have somebody that really is not concerned with any of that on the other, other, on the other end, say someone like Chuck Baker, um, you know, who, you know, later in life was, you know, did, playing on no teeth or false teeth and, and never literally said he never practiced off, off the stage, you know, and, and all of these different ways of, of getting there. But, um, you know, you can draw a line between, like, maybe personally, I, I, I like to think I could, I could draw a line of an imagination, an imaginary line between where I am and where Doc is and say, you know, if I'd started early enough, if I really knew, and maybe if I practiced eight hours a day, maybe I could have been, you know, if I started when I was seven or whatever, I could at least, it, it could be possible, right? You know, I'm not saying I could do it, but, you know, it, it seems like it's possible. Um, there's no amount of practicing that I think you can do of all the stuff that we're talking about that would get you to play like Maynard Ferguson. Um, and, and that's because Maynard took the ultimate shortcut, which is he just started doing it. He started to play that way instead of trying to play Clark studies for, you know, 20 minutes a day and then, and then lip slurs and then scales. And then may, I'm sure he practiced, but he just kind of started playing like Maynard. Right. I mean, he went he went there directly without thinking of 20 years of foundational uh, routine practice and all the things that we like to talk about. There are shortcuts there. There are imagine there, there are shortcuts of imagination. So what you see is, is people that play like uh, I went to school with a guy named Scott Engelbright. And I heard Scott play. I stood next to him for a couple of years and and Scott, uh, he just did it. Right. And that, that wasn't that he didn't practice or that he didn't play a lot or anything like that. I'm not saying that at all. But, you know, he was one of that generation that picked up their horn and started playing along with Maynard solos. Right. And there, you know, we had, we all know people that did that or we some of us did it. I never did that, but I never occurred to me you could even do that. But when you when you meet those people, what they did was they didn't they weren't, well, I'm going to do everything my teacher says every day and I'm going to practice, you know, three hours a day and I'm going to go a half step on all my scales every week. And then I'm eventually going to be able to play a double C. No, I just started to try to play a double G and figured it out somehow to play along with Chameleon. And it was, you know, and and that is that's a thing that's sometimes a missing link in and how we conceive of like what great players do. Um, they just, you know, start playing Carnival Venice or try to, <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm going to jump, I'm going to pass go and collect my $200. I'm going to jump right line, past yeah. it. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's interesting to think about, you know, there's, there's a way to do stuff that maybe we haven't considered, you know, and that's by, by literally, and I don't mean like when we talk as teachers about shortcuts, we're talking about skipping essential things that, are foundational, but there are all, because the people that do that, by the way, the people that play with Maynard records when they're in, in eighth grade, they eventually come back to all the stuff we're talking about because it's not sustainable, right? They come back when they're 20 or 30 or whatever, and that stuff gives out because it's not sustainable. But there is an element of that where we can say, okay, well, I want to play double C. Well, there's no, I'm not going to do scale studies for that. I'm just going to pick up my horn. I'm going to figure out how to play, you know, a G and then go a half step higher. And uh, the imagination is, is, you know, it's missing from a lot of people's uh, concept of practice. And I, I've heard also just, you know, thinking in those certain registers, like um, uh, John Faddis, you know, said, mm -hmm. I, I just, 
I heard Dizzy Gillespie solos up an octave always, you know, from the time I was yeah. a, a, a younger player. And yeah. so that's what he did. He just started playing Dizzy Gillespie solos up an octave. Yeah, yeah, and and it wasn't a thing because and he and, and if he would like you know I was I, I I use this as an example you know Alan Vizzuti's fire dance, right where he's he's double tonguing between low A and A on top of the side so he's he's like going between double octaves, yeah. uh, and then double tonguing it right, and and it's not like he's he you know I think what he did and I don't have my horn here but I, I call it just kind of screwing around like 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 kind of like you could learn to do that sort of in a very messy like you know bad way and then clean it up as opposed to starting it at, at you know metronome marking 50 yeah you know like like slowly do he's like no just kind of do it and then figure out how to make it work and uh you know that's uh, you know i don't i I've, I've never talked to alan about that specific how he learned to play like that but i i can sit around my uh, front hall which is real echoey and i can kind of do some of that you know and i can see how you would do it without having to spend five years practicing you know out of the arbin book you know and and notching it up you know a half step at a time well, I have to say one other thing here about your book and get, getting back to these, getting back to all of this and, and uh, rounding things out here, because I know you got to go just a little bit, um, but the titles. All right, <laughs> yeah. These exercises are worth the price of the book alone. I mean, my wife is Swedish, so I like, I enjoyed the Halls of Valsalva. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. The Parduba double flush is a particular favorite of mine in the book, and there's a whole bunch yep. of them. And uh, in addition to this great book, also on your on your site, uh, scottbelk.com, you also have um, some downloadable um, tracks to play along, play exercises along mm -hmm. with as well, right? Right, yeah. Um, I've got a few that are, are uh, I mean, the tracks themselves can be, uh, they're kind of groove based tracks that I did in logic and created. And I've, all, I've also done some in, in uh, band in the box where um, they're, they're set up. Some of them are set up as technical studies. Some of them are set up as jazz studies um, where we play um, like a Clark two etude, but it's, it's based on rhythm changes. And then you've got a rhythm changes track. And then uh, one thing I do recommend, I will recommend this to anybody um, regardless of what, you know, uh, is, is an app called the amazing slow downer. And the amazing slowdown is about, uh, I think, nine dollars or maybe fourteen dollars. And the um, the technology is is such that that you can not just speed things up and slow them down, which is great, but you can tune things by half steps. And so you can, and without degrading the quality, that's the other thing that's just that blows my mind. So mm -hmm. I do, I probably use that app more than anything in my practice, other than my metronome. And that is any kind of any kind of accompaniment track to be able to manipulate tempo and um, and key. And then, you know, so those those tracks that I, I've developed for my students or for my own practice or are, are just to kind of provide harmonic and groove context, you know. Um, I also am I, I, I did want to mention I'm doing a I'm in the middle of a project, a practice project. And uh, I've been playing uh, since actually it's been two years every day. The first thing I do is play Donna Lee for an hour. So um, in I've been in F sharp for seven months. <laughs> so my first hour of practice before I do Clark or Chickowitz or Maggio or Stamp or um, Di Martino or any of the things that I do, I've I've taken I've taken my right my uh, my project and I put it first, and I and so I don't have to wait an hour to get to foundational improvisation practice, and um, I'll be posting more videos as I go, but I use that amazing slow downer, and I. So when I get up to, like I'm in F sharp and I play everything down the octave and I pivot to the low register, and um, I'll take that up to about two, two forty beats per minute with my track and I'm improvising. I do it slow form. I do it down the octave. I do it 
up the octave in the practice mute. Even when I don't have to, I practice the up the upper octave in my practice mute. I take a lot of rest. I do it with brush uh, drum genius, a brushes track at 160, and then for five minutes, and then I do it again for five minutes at 170, and then the track is at 170 or one actually it's 186 now, and then starts going up. So I'm trying to be give myself credit for being able to play the trumpet and not have to micromanage it from the start. And um, with the idea that I'm gonna, I'm gonna immediately play repertoire and literature from the minute I sit down to play. I do free buzz and I buzz a, an F with a tuner <laughs> if I can get it out. And then I'm, I'm bang, I'm into playing Donnelly. I've done that for an hour. I started, it'll be two years on January 1st that I I've done it for an hour minimum. And I started the project of just playing it daily on October 7th, two, more than two years ago. So almost exactly two years ago. And it's changed my, foundationally changed my playing. It's been pretty cool. Wow, so, what a great project. That sounds it's cool. it's totally, yeah, yeah. And and I started out, I've got a database, or I had done a spreadsheet of all the stuff I wanted to practice. It was during sort of kind of the end days of uh, pre-vaccine pandemic. And I just, I wanted to do 20, 15, 20 minutes a day of Don Lee. And that just kept getting longer because it wasn't enough. And then I realized that, you know, around Christmas that, yeah, I need to do an hour a day. So I went through all 12 keys, two weeks at a time, um, I would do one key. And for the first hour, and sometimes it would be an hour to an hour and a half or more. So I've, I think I've missed 11 days in two years. And um, it's been, you know, it's, I'm going to do a probably some kind of a, a presentation or a book or something about it because it's it's trying to come up with a way of practicing that's uh, you you've got two categories I, I say this about your career you've got what you do that everybody else does you have to do that stuff that's the stuff we're talking about and then what do you do that nobody else does or how do you do something that's different than what everybody else does and that's that's what your contribution is to the, 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 the field or, you know, and I didn't go in to do the lip slurs, like thinking what's different. Uh, how can I do something different? I just wanted to, I was bored with playing lip slurs the way that they were written. And I made an association with the, uh, the playing Woody Shaw and um, Michael Brecker, who use alternate fingerings as musical devices, harmonic devices. And I talked to Pat Harbison, who's a, about to retire from IU about this in 1988. I said, wouldn't it be cool if somebody went around? 1988, came up with a way of playing that used a lot of the alternate fingerings, but not in a way that's a, an effect. So if you think of like, you know, Lee Morgan on Sidewinder, but he's, he's doing the but yeah, da -da 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 -da, like alternate fingering, that's an effect. But what's happening in the books is you're actually using, you're using alternate, uh, alternate positions and fingerings as devices like harmonic devices and it's a way of carving up the octaves in ways that you wouldn't normally do because the trumpet has seven natural natural um divisions and all the different combinations are ways of dividing an octave musically and intervallically there's some deep stuff with this it's not just <laughs> i guess you know I, 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 i've spent a lot of time thinking about it i guess you, i you find know. it interesting me and two people two other people find the uh, find that interesting <laughs> well you got two more right here yeah here's no, two all right, right here. yeah, it's yeah. a great book <laughs> i love it well scott we should uh, probably wrap up here i know yeah. you're going to get back to your busy teaching and uh, uh yep. another what three hours of donna lee practice and stuff <laughs> no, i've already done that for today yeah okay uh, good, I, get good. Go, I might get to move back into the normal the world of the normal when i get well back you're off the hook then for yeah, donna lee yeah, absolutely <laughs> all right yeah, yeah. well thanks for your time this has been uh, great and some really good uh you know tips for all of us um yeah. to learn from so thanks again uh, hopefully something will, will ring a bell and, and uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's, there, this, this doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be a drag. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, practicing can be something that's actually interesting and fun. And that's what, that's how I know if I'm doing it right, that I'm actually enjoying it. Well, one last time, this is a great book, everybody. And this belongs in every Trumpeter's Library, in my opinion, and you can pick it up at scottbelk.com. We'll post up uh, a link below for all that stuff. Thanks again, Scott, for being here with us. Appreciate it. Thanks, love guys. having you in the group and love seeing your, cool. uh, your input. Absolutely. So thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's been great hanging out with you guys.